This week on Hazardous Materials, we stand X Factor, Live Shot makes her debut, and I struggle to say Super Cyborg the Cyborg Superman. Got in one take. Warning The following podcast is utter nonsense and may cause agoraphobia, kleptomania, insomnia, and oppositional defiance disorder. We are required by law to provide you with this disclaimer for Hazardous Materials. And welcome to another episode of Hazardous Materials, last week's comics this week. This week we are, in fact, looking at last week's comics. And we've got a decent array this time, including uh, probably my favorite book of the year. I don't know if anything else is going to top it in the back half. But uh, X Factor number one by Leah Williams and David Baldion. Yeah, we're bringing the good stuff up to the front of this. X Factor is is easily my favorite book in several months. It's such a good like procedural mystery. But here's the thing that I really like caught me craft wise on this book. All right, is the book is incredibly dense, but it's not a slog to read. It takes no. you a while to get through it, but it's all really engaging dialogue that moves the plot forward, develops the mystery, and gives you a ton of great character moments. And along with that, David Baldion's cartooning is bar none. He's only gotten better since Domino and Gwenpool Strikes Again, and he just does so such great little like facial expression bits i love that little bit where dakin's messing with the clerk's necktie very good little bit of physical comedy Uh, yeah i was reading this and and um they they resolve things rather quickly when when the whole thing with aurora was starting it's like oh crap we're gonna be going through several issues where they try to figure this out and then boom they get it done before the, the the before i even see the middle staple in the book yeah they're done with it i'm like Okay. Yeah, it's kind of like a proof of concept for the idea of this iteration of X Factor, Mm -hmm. which is they go out to investigate mutant deaths and make sure they're actually dead before they resurrect them and accidentally make a duplicate. Yeah, this comes from the fact that uh, Northstar senses the fact that his sister is dead. So he immediately goes to Krakoa and insists, you know, resurrect my sister. And, you know, because Northstar has got that level of insensitivity that Quicksilver tends to have, except not as intense... Uh, he doesn't realize that all the people he's just flown over are the same people that are all in line trying to get their own loved ones resurrected. So, you know, when you have so many of this going on, the people that were doing the resurrection process is like, you know, we, we have so many, we have to have a process, which means you have to give us proof of death. And all you guys are feeling, <laughs> I, I feel for you, Barbara, but you need to go and find what's going out and of course that's what starts the whole yeah. idea for the he, investigation uh, he goes to drown his sorrows at a blobs tiki bar who i'm very glad to see lee williams writing again after age of x-man where she really did a great job with him as a character he got his little uh, trucker mustache yes back. he does he's, he's back to full size again and so there he runs into polaris who has nothing better to do and is, she's been a no stranger to investigating things with x-factor so she's like, yeah, we can put out feelers for a team, get a little crew together. Mm-hmm. And so they get uh, Rachel Summers, who has the uh, werewolf puppy that she picked up in Excalibur. Amazing baby. Amazing baby. A very, very sweet boy. Love Amazing Baby. Uh, you have Drunken Hanger on Dakin, Wolverine's son. Who insists on coming on to this, even though everybody keeps pushing him away. And then they explain to him, no, Northstar is like, you are a, are a bisexual disaster. A disaster bisexual, <laughs> sir, is yes. the proper term. Because uh, Dakin will flirt with everything, ruining any situation that they're in. And I love that he counters, well, well, yeah, we got Prodigy, the respectable bisexual, to keep everything balanced. (laughs) And I was really happy. That was a great line. Yeah, I was like, I don't remember the last time I saw Prodigy. It was probably Young Avengers when Gillen and McKelvey were on the book. Yeah, when he was still depowered. He, uh, because... The way Prodigy's powers went out, um, he just lost the ability to bring on new abilities. Mm -hmm. But everything he'd already gotten, he retained. So he was still an asset to whatever team he was on. And apparently, Lee Williams did say that there's going to be a big arc showing how he's Prodigy has regained his powers. Yeah. My first time was just like, oh, you know, resurrection stuff. But apparently there's a bit more to it. So I'm curious to see where that goes. So, yeah, I'm kind of wondering, because Prodigy never really died in a book. So I wonder if he went through the Crucible. We oh man, I want to. Oh, I don't want to. I don't want to see my boy have to fight apocalypse. <laughs> oh, poor guy. Yeah. But uh, rounding out this team is uh, Johnny Come Lately, who is busy gluing googly eyes to his Crocs. 
my beloved eye boy love that kid eye boy's got a lot of potential he does especially since they actually like gave him powers besides having eyes all over speaking of powers let's talk about rachel summers and her upgraded abilities yeah her like psychic chronovision yeah cool as hell she can like recreate psychic impressions throughout time which completely come uh, that, that should be no surprise her first appearance was doing weird crap through yeah. time with psionic abilities. I was like, why hadn't they ever used this before? It's a this, re- is, this is Days of Future Past n- stuff. Yeah, there's some about. really fun mutant CSI bits where you got Prodigy running through the crime scene and like he's got his little data pad and he's writing stuff <sighs> down. You got Rachel, like they do a cool visual where it's her flashing through like the psychic memories of the room and just like scrolling through all the guests that have walked in and out. I thought that was a really nice little okay, visual. Okay, so I just want to put this out. As we're describing this, I'm ha- I'm getting so much joy about this issue that I'm getting goosebumps. Look it's, at that. It's so damn good. <laughs> it is such a good comic. And, and you know what? Such a good comic to introduce to somebody who's not used to comics. Yeah. Uh, there's no word walls. You don't have to deal mm-hmm. with that. Um, exposition is done very effortlessly. Uh, someone knows how to do narrative flow. Hey, <laughs> Marvel, way to go. Make a DC look fucking foolish. Yeah, it's, again, like, this is just kind of, pr- like, proof of concept of, hey, great things happen when you expand your talent pool besides, like, the five dudes who've been working for you since the 90s. God, hint, yes. hint, DC. Yeah, but, I heard that Snyder is uh, moving away from the mainline titles. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> but back, Read the room. Let's say, back to the positive on X Factor. So they track down uh, Aurora's car to the bottom of a lake. Which they have eye voice search out. And there's like, tons of cars yeah, in this lake. It's a great little bit of Rachel being like, just look for car shaped objects. And it cuts to like just tons of cars at the bottom of it. And when I saw them talk about this, it's like, I mean, what's up with that? Why, why is that happening? And they, without even skipping a beat, like the next page, they talk about the fact that the, um, the police were trying to recover the body of the person that was involved in this. But because of the way the, the river is, you can't pull vehicles out. So they can only just pull bodies out. And that's the reason why there's so many cars still there, because they can't withdraw them. I was like, that's pretty cool. And so Polaris has no such problems, though, and pulls all the cars out. They find Aurora. They drop her off with the five. And uh, they had to search it out like they were in a used car lot. Yeah. It's like, which one? It's an SUV. OK, that does. You got to narrow it. <laughs> I got six here now. <laughs> there, And then that leads to a really sweet scene that, again, just highlights how in touch with these characters Leah Williams is, because... Polaris and Krakoa do have a uh, fraught history, as Polaris was one of the original X-Men that was captured by Krakoa back in Giant Size X-Men number one. But they kind of make peace with all that and work together using her magnetic abilities and his natural geographic abilities to create X-Factor's base, which is this gorgeous metal tower. and The Boneyard. The Boneyard. It looks... Oh, it is a spectacle. It is really great, and it, it looks like a, a segmented spine. Yeah, it's, you know, it, it looks like armored bone. It's I cool. I adore this book. Uh, I can't recommend it highly enough. It is my favorite of the X line, and if you've watched this show at all, you know how much we love the X line here. And yeah, X Factor has long been my favorite mutant book, and this is a worthy addition to that legacy. We have so many quality X books out these days. They really are. And this isn't just us being fanboys because, honestly, X Men has been just mediocre crap for a decade. It's been pretty decade. dire. I mean, nothing good has really come out of it except maybe like a, a gemstone here or I'd there. I'd say I, I really dug uh, Bendis and Bacello's run on Uncanny X Men mm-hmm. with Right Clops. That was good stuff. But yeah, yeah on, on the whole, it's been, as Hickman said himself in the House of X, the lost decade. Uh, yeah, exactly. But oh, there's so many quality X books out it there is. right now. A, if you are an X fan, you are spoiled with riches. All right. Now, we're also looking at Cable number two, which has got a cover looking like he's in with Flynn. <laughs> uh, I love this one. Uh, this one kind of got set up from Wolverine because uh, the, uh, the, the the five that are one, the Stepford Cuckoos, are wanting to get a date with Cable. Well, it turns out Cable is now dating all of them. Yes, all five of them. And he goes on a date one at a time while the other four spy on them and giggle in their room. Yes. Excellent. So Cable's out investigating a uh, mutie cutie kidnapping, as the Daily Bugle calls it. Yes, he's investigating a baby mutant has been kidnapped because this kind of thing is apparently 
pretty personal to him. Yeah, as someone who, as a mutant baby, he was kidnapped yes. into the future and <laughs> raised in an apocalyptic hellscape. But uh, yeah, his his Papa Cyclops is there too. Like, I'm looking for my kid. Where is he at? And the cops are like, Well, he was just here, just investigating that mutant kidnapping. He's like, Oh. Yeah, I think this takes place in Portland, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Philadelphia. Philadelphia. That was one of those things. Because Cyclops <laughs> goes, the, the cops are like, hey, go get a cheesesteak or something. Yeah, it'd be, a, it'd be against the law if you didn't get a cheesesteak. And steak. cut to my favorite page this week of Su- Scott Summers about to devour a cheesesteak. <laughs> <laughs> so the uh, Cable's trying to talk to the cops. and he's, put, he's got this whole thing, you know, I'm a representative of Krakoa and I'm looking into this. And the cops are all looking at him like, listen, you look like a kid. And honestly, my captain's only making me talk to you because he thinks there's something wrong with your eye. <laughs> so what is up with that anyway? You, you get, get something going on there with your eye. And they also, when Scotch is like, oh, it must be genetic or something. These <laughs> muties with their weird eyes. So The cops um, do suck at this issue. They do they suck. Do the, so Cable has to do all the investigation, which uh, does in fact lead him to have to tangle with some space knights. <laughs> Yes, which was incredibly uh, okay. The, the, this is speaking from me. I I just uh, started doing hair clicks for the first time in a long time with my buddy Steve, and like the day before we did this, I was using the Space Knights for the very first time. And then I crack Cable. And was like, freaking more Space Knights. What's going on with this? Yeah, and they tangle because Cable's got a uh, Space Knight sword. Yeah, because that's what you do. Krakoa. Yeah. In issue one, a Space Knight had fallen on Krakoa and left the sword, and Cable was like, oh, cool sword. I like the fact that the cops are sweating him the entire time. And him and Esme are, like, making out in front of that house, and they, the cops just come and go, keep up the good work. <laughs> <laughs> so it turns out the kid was kidnapped by, uh, what was the name of that mutant-hating cult? The, the, it, it's popped up a couple times in docs, but I don't remember. You're talking about the, no, God, I, I can't think of anything except the... Uh, Friends of Humanity or the, cru- the, the Crucibles? Something no. something like Friends Crusaders. of Humanity. But yeah, anyways, that's not the important part. The One important of. part is that he throws down with uh, some some Space Knights. He does. And uh, me, oh, i got to cut back to uh, the scene with Cyclops and the Sandwich where he <laughs> is interrupted by Emma Frost. Cyclops is one true love. Fight me. And she's like, hey. Your son's dating my dating my daughters, and he's like, "Well, that's got a little weird, but uh, good for him, I guess." Yeah, I'll talk. And to him she about says, it. "Don't let him break their break their hearts, except for he- for Esme. My God, does she need it? <laughs> <laughs> that's sad because it, it appears that she's the one out of five that actually seems to care about him. I, I look forward so much to this teen romance drama with these these six crazy kids. Is Esme the one that uh, was killed with Magneto, or yes, is... in New X Men? Okay. So she's so, uh, the one that obviously needs an issue. Poor girl. Poor girl's been heartbroken. Well, she's going to be, probably, by Cable. <laughs> but, yeah, and uh, this each issue has ended with a little flash forward to future Cable doing some stuff in the future, mm-hmm. riding one of those uh, on a robot horse. And, oh, God, I, I swore, because when I came in and I was telling you about it, I was like, man, I really don't like the artist that they had in the second half of this book, and he told me it's the same artist. Yeah, Phil Noto, <laughs> but just doing... Uh, more of his older style of inking and coloring, because he inks and colors himself in this book. Yeah, and this I, seems like there was a lot of heavy inks in the in the second half. Yeah, which I, I actually like that tonal shift of showing. I know like, you do. <laughs> it's good arting. Phil Noto rocks, and I also should shout out uh, Jerry Dugan scripting while he's also working on Marauders. You know, you know. Speaking of heavy inks, uh, what's the name of that artist that did uh, New Mutants number eighteen? I'm just kind of curious. Uh, Bill Sienkiewicz. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, that's how you pronounce it. <laughs> I was watching uh, uh, a New Mutants roundtable on uh, Comic Con, and he came on, and it's in Kevitz. In Kevitz? Yeah. Okay. Which is exactly how I pronounced it way back in the day when you corrected me. I don't think you did. I think you're making this up for clout. Okay, I might. <laughs> but, anyways. <laughs> I still want to be right about something, damn it. Let me have this. <laughs> Cable number two. If Casey wants to be right about something, he can be right about that it's a goodbye. Yes. This is very true. Cable's a goodbye. I am kind of curious to see where the uh, cuckoos are going to go with this one. Fingers crossed. As well as, of course, seeing where the space science are going to go with this one. <laughs> you know what? Going out, I did notice something weird about the space science. Space science are basically humans. But these space science kept referring to them as monkeys, meat bags. I'm like, that's a kind that that's droid talk, sir. <laughs> are they? I mean, and just when I'm thinking, okay, maybe they changed up space science and they are robots. Esme goes, no, they've got brains. Mm-hmm. Okay, you're confusing the hell out of me. Maybe they're uh, they're more machine than man now. Got some Darth Vader going. I don't know. 
They've been in the they've been hanging out in the Hasbro verse for too long. I mean, back when Rom was Space Knight, they were mostly machine with like you know a, a human or Galadorian uh, neural net mm-hmm. or whatever was going on. And then they went with third generation, which are basically just armored people, like with Icon. So I have no idea what the hell these things are. I guess we'll find out. Space Knight information. And uh, next up on our list is X Men number ten from Jonathan Hickman and Laniel Yu who accept the Herculean task of making Vulcan interesting. <laughs> and, and you really have to because, man, when Vulcan was bad, Vulcan was Superboy Prime bad. He's Yeah, he first shows up in Deadly Genesis as part of Xavier's secret class who got just murked by Krakoa, totally. except for Vulcan who got abducted by aliens and turned into his, like a basically a Superman character. He got the Deken treatment. Yeah, he just uh, punches a plane and kills Banshee with it. And yeah. Uh, but the only good thing to come out of Deadly Genesis at the time, I would say, was uh, Darwin. Beloved mutant, can't die. But apparently cool can dude. get killed in the first movies introduced yeah, to him. Yeah, still bullshit. hate that. I never understand that. But anyways, so uh, Vulcan is decided not to go on a family vacation with the rest of the summer's brood. He's busy brooding on the moon with uh, two more members of the Deadly of the uh, Deadly Genesis group. Who are insisting that he party and drink with them oh, until they're unconscious. Are we drinking or are we drinking? <laughs> Great line. <laughs> so he's like, oh, I'm just going to go for a walk on the moon. And what does he run into but Kotati? Because <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, there was another thing on the moon. Oh, yeah. So he gets into a big old Kotati fight while having uh, nightmarish flashbacks to his harrowing origin of being experimented on by aliens. Who uh? <laughs> who don't like his good good side? Yeah, they're like, oh, you're bad to the bone, dude. We're gonna put you, give you a nice crunchy good candy outside, but uh, once that cracks, buddy, you're gonna be you're gonna be blowing shit up. Mm-hmm. The way we like it, which he does in this issue. The Katati push him a little too far, and he is just he just starts barbecuing. Though. Oh yeah, burns, and they're plant people, so they don't like that. Even in the lack of an atmosphere in the moon, he's still able to burn the shit out of them. Well, the blue the blue area of the moon's filled with all that lovely lovely oxygen. It's true, because the uh, the Inhumans chilled there. Yep. But yeah, this is a. Uh, I don't have a ton to say about this issue, but it was fun and made me interested in Vulcan, which again, which is a Herculean effort, like it you is. said. It's. <laughs> I didn't think it was possible because, like, the best story with Vulcan before this was uh, War of Kings back in DNA's Guardians of the Galaxy run. Mm-hmm. But Vulcan wasn't the interesting part of that. It was everything else going on around him that was interesting. He was just like the oh shit big weapon MacGuffin. So now we got of uh, the three Summers brothers. We got two of them who are tormented with evil sides. And you got Scott. And Scott's living his best life right now. He really is. <laughs> he's he, got... He, he's loving his life, smiling all the time, multiple women, that's it. eating he's, what he likes. He's got the greatest polycule. He's got him. He's got Gene. He's got Logan. He's got Emma. Like, it's a great... I, I love this love parallelogram. Well, you know what? I, I, I forgot to mention way back in the Cable 2 thing. Did you notice that the one of the Stepford Cuckoos has got a diamond form? Yeah, I did see that. I'd never know that. I mean, it makes sense. They are clones of Emma. Yeah, that's true. It only follows they would get her. But this is the first time I've ever seen them use that. Hey, well, you know, also, Krakoa, they've talked about how there's some genetic tinkering going on with the oh, eggs. They're, be- they're best versions. Exactly. You got Sinister in there? Anything's possible. I love Sinister. <laughs> God, you just make me feel so giddy every time I talk about Sinister. Before we move on from Maximum, though, I do want to highlight this last splash page where Vulcan reads a letter from his brother being like, wish you came and hang out with this bro, but I get it, with the the Summers family going on a little beach vacation. Very sweet and fun. Mm-hmm. Good stuff. Good taking stuff the kids. all around. They're exactly. The they're, they're adult children who are younger than they were before, but still they're adult children. Yeah. It's good times. And now we're going to kind of look at Empire number three. Now, we, we we put some real praise on Empire Number One because that's how you start a party. Empire Number Three is how you end the party quickly. Yeah. So, like like you said, we've been enjoying Empire, the uh, Ewing slot shitty big event epic. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I really liked about it was like, wow, this is a good forward moving event comic. You don't see that too often. All right. Well, here's why. Because issue number three <laughs> is basically an extended advertisement for all the Empire tie-ins. You've got an opening page that refers you to the events of Captain Marvel number 18. You've got, uh, geez, a weird two to three page long sequence of Tony Stark talking to Reed Richards about what's going on in Captain America Empire, in Thor Empire, in Avengers Empire. You get a cut to what was going to be the Black Panther in the Ages of Wakanda issue, which is a really, man, I, 
it felt super that sequence particularly like screamed laziness to me yeah. because it's just the bit from infinity war where the outriders are trying to go through the bubble but now it's plant people and the thing is there and not don't, don't get me wrong i believe every story is improved by the inclusion of the thing mm-hmm. but like the it's just it just felt like a lazy shout out. And like, I, I, it doesn't feel like a reference. It just felt like wholesale copying and pasting. Yeah, I mean, I, I get that Marvel's trying to recoup their their losses, and maybe that's not exactly what they're trying to do here. But uh, when it comes to summer events, you got to get paid. This is this is their December. This is their Christmas. Uh, people are, spend more on comic books during the summer months than any other time, and that's the reason why there's so many events going on. Um, this book is basically trying to get you buy this, buy that, buy this, buy that. But when it really comes down to Marvel event books, you can largely ignore the satellite yeah, books no kidding. and just keep to the core. And I'm still mad that most of the times I was really excited for see Black Panther and the Angel Conda and Squadron Supreme got the can while I flipped through Captain America and that was some pretty boring jingoistic nonsense. Uh, there was Thor Empire, nothing much happened there. Like, Event, you read Avengers Empire and said that yeah that was, was a big nothing that was murder. a big snoozeville and I really wanted to read stri- strangely enough I really wanted to read Strike Force uh, because that's where Spider Woman is in this and as you can see eh, I like me some Spider Woman um, that's gone yeah I really wanted to read Squadron Supreme because I've always been a Squadron Supreme and this one's gonna be written by Mark Wade <sighs> I know man I don't don't understand these calls very strange. But uh, the the issue does end with a couple big revelations. So Mantis rolls up being uh, Koi's mom, and she's like, yeah, Swordsman, his dad is really getting in his head with this world domination thing. She looks good. Yeah, she looks much more Celestial Madonna than she has in her past few appearances in Guardians of the Years. Yeah. Then uh, Clert is like, so uh, when we we going to kill that son? And everyone's like, what? He's like, yeah, the only way to get rid of the uh, the Katati infection is by blowing up a sun and killing up the solar system. Thought you guys knew that. Which blows my mind, because didn't we learn our lesson from Dark Phoenix? <laughs> didn't, didn't we all learn the lesson, you don't blow up signs? Claire said, fuck those broccoli people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, those <He's>, poor broccoli <laughs> people. He is the bizarro gym shooter. But, uh, uh, oh, God, that's a, that's a low blow. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, uh, what's his name? General Glory or whatever, the Cree dude, is like, hey, Hammer Lady, you gave your hammer to Captain Marvel. Captain Glory. Captain Glory, you uh, he's, he's he's got a proper superhero name. Yeah, not not as good as a Major Glory from the JLI, but no. still pretty cool. But he's like, hey, Hammer Lady, you you smell like Scroll. What's up with that? And she's like, it's me, the M- Scroll Queen, the great or the grandma of Teddy, and I'm manipulating him to be a bad man and pull up this solar system, which felt. And again, it, like after we've had such a good first two issues, this felt very like mustache twirly. Mm-hmm. It felt like a hat on a hat. Oh, the, the villain has got two hats. I did two stove pops. Uh, I did really like, and she might be an established character, and I'm just not familiar with her. But Mergun, the half Cree, half Scroll witch, never heard very of good quality. Love me a direct Knights of the Round Table at reference, but and then that, that, that pretty much is. I thought that was you know when you, you told me that I was like, oh, there's that's a, a little on the nose, but. really on the nose. <laughs> hey, we got this is a book with a space sword. So. It does have a space sword. <laughs> we are running into our fair share of swords this week. It's true. There's that. There's Cable with his space sword. There's Ten of Swords, the upcoming X event. I, I really think that the Space Knight sword and the Scroll sword are going to be involved in that. You've heard it here first, folks. It's the Summer of Swords. It is. And uh, just, just a quick correction. It's Major Victory. Major Victory. Yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> well... Anyways, all right. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about Suicide Squad number seven, which uh, decent book, right to the point, very simple story. Yeah, uh, big contrast because I read this is the second book I read this week after X Factor number one, and after how dense X Factor number one was, it really made me notice how kind of breezy Suicide Squad number seven was. It's a very quick, fast-paced action pa- action-filled issue. Uh, Tom Taylor is always a scripting with Daniel Sampere on R2, uh, not the normal Bruno Redondo, but still very good. And with very pretty good, comparable, I liked it. Yeah, pretty comparable style. Uh, this one is about, uh, after the last issue, Deadshot, free to go from Suicide Squad, so he goes back home. But uh, it's not that simple. No, he reconnects with his daughter after uh, getting the uh, the official let go. But just as soon as he shows up, the feds show up because uh, he's wanted for some reason. Yep. So they screwed him over. Or a boy, Ted Cord, who is uh, still in some deep machinations 
unleashes. I still have an idea what's what's going I on got, with that. I gotta know. Like I'm, I'm so curious how Tom Taylor is gonna pull this off because I love my boy Ted. He's and you're messing with it. Exactly. Like he's not normally a dark character. It's like when they made Maxwell Lord evil. That wound up working pretty well. But I still I, don't know, had, I still had trouble with that too. Yeah, but. Only yeah. because at the time that they, they made Mad Max Lord evil and Wonder Woman killed him, they also released that weird the, JLI book. Yeah, the throw, uh, formerly known as the Justice League. Yes. So it kind of had a like, that crossed was, wires. What a strange book. Like, you've got three people in this book. They're dead from horrible situations. <laughs> you had um, Sue, you had Elongated Man, and Maxwell were all alive during this. Sue died from a fire. Uh, elongated man uh, died trying to find out about her death. I forgot how he checked out. And, of course, Maxwell had his head done clockwise by yeah. her, uh, a girl, a Wonder Woman. But uh, to be fair, though, like it was clearly Dematis and Giffen and McGuire just given free reign to do a sequel to JLI and not not care about what, ha- what horrible things have been done to their characters in their absence. And I like that. Me too. But anyways, uh, so Deadshot is... Uh, reconnecting with his daughter, who... And I know why you're laughing. You're laughing yeah. at Live Shot. <laughs> yes. Who has created the superhero identity Live Shot for herself. She's taken some archery, and she's had she's really some good. of her... Yeah, she has her dad's aim. But it's a really fun, like... It reminds me a lot of Honey Badger, in a lot of ways. Another Tom Taylor creation. Oh, God. I really wish that Honey Badger would come back being Honey Badger. Yeah. It, it feels like Tom Taylor's special talent is creating fun kid girl sidekicks for people Mm -hmm. for for ruthless killers because and she even has her own sidekick she's got a little dog who also has a little visor it's really cute he writes really well yeah for for kid sidekicks exactly which is hard to do which is also really impressive given how dark his books tend to go yeah there's always like a nice little bright spot in there though so Ah. the feds show up dead shots like hey like you don't have to rough me up for my family just take me in but uh then they That's, get a little trigger happy. Uh, live shot takes a shot at him and gets him right in the knee. A very good little shot there. And so uh, Floyd fights his way out and is like, I, I can't kill these guys because my kid's watch. And so wound, 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 the, wound. The revolutionaries <laughs> come to pick him up. And he's like, all right, let's, let's, let's go end the Suicide Squad. So Yeah, and that's the end of the book. Yeah, very quick, very good, though. What they firmly establish is the fact that Deadshot's daughter loves him. Yes. And this that's is, a big deal because the very beginning of this book, you know, he's got that idea. It's like, you know, I don't I know you don't want me here. I'm, I, I just want to help out. And then just boom out the gate. Daddy. And I'm like, good. The other, he needs something yeah. good in his life. The other thing I really, really appreciate is this is the first time that Deadshot's daughter has ever felt like a character instead of just being a prop to give Deadshot angst. Yeah, because he usually wrote her as being like four or five years old. Yeah, that was like. 15, I think she's introduced like 15 years ago in the Christus Gage miniseries from like 2005. Or that one shot that he did where he was wearing a jacket on the cover. Yeah, exactly. That's that's the exact series. Okay, cool. Yeah, it was that the second Deadshot miniseries. And I, I never really liked that because it felt like trying to make a, a little too cliche action action star. Yeah, and, and the reason I'd been following that, um, I've been following Deadshot ever since, obviously, Secret Six, mm-hmm. which is where he truly belongs. <laughs> Get me my Gail Simone, get me my Secret Six, put Deadshot in there, and you'll find me a happy camper. But so I've been following Deadshot. Whenever the like, Secret Six would end or something like that, and they put Deadshot in a miniseries or something like that, I'm usually following. And that's how I picked up on the family storyline, like mm-hmm. you were talking about. Um, I, I like that this whole series is a step in the right direction because New 52 Deadshot really kind of broke my heart. They just they doubled down on making him a boring action hero, and it's like it's not what I want. I like he was just a, a blonde kid that could shoot real well. There was no darkness to him. There's no le- there's no serious level cynicism. In yeah, him. like because you can you can write Deadshot two like there, there's two pretty good schools of Deadshot. There's the Ostrander, very dark, nihilistic, like has a death wish, which I love that explanation for his bright shiny costume. He's like, yeah, I'm trying to get hit. Like, yeah, I wear chrome and bright red. <laughs> like and he doesn't really even say it unless somebody points it out. Exactly. It's like why do you act like this? And I'm like, I just don't care. Like one of my favorite moments from Ostrander's run is where he has to assassinate a uh, presidential candidate, and Waller's like, "Get in, get out, and be done." And he just goes ahead and does it, and waits for uh, the feds to show up and just riddle him with bullets. And Waller's just like, "Nah, you don't get to get out that easy, Lawton." Like, ugh, really, 
Ostrander's run on Suicide Squad from the 80s. One of my favorite comics of all time. Highly recommend tracking it down. Yeah, and of course, my personal love, Gail Simone, mm. uh, Deadshot. Who is still a very, a very dark cynic. But it's like a black comedy version. Yeah, a black comedy who, who is uh, is open to the bromance, but will kill somebody if he's ordered to do so. <laughs> like we did on that uh, that Amazonian island. Yeah, he's a very pragmatic character. <laughs> yeah, because the person that was paying him said, that woman's getting away, kill her. And everybody else is like debating it. And Deadshot's like, <laughs> all right. And I, I love that <laughs> bit where cause someone calls like, Deadshot, they were unarmed. And it's like, what? They were going to kill us. No, they weren't. Eh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, him. His tension with Catman is all time great. One of <sighs> one of the greatest male male ships out and there. And we still have not seen Catman come back since Rebirth. Uh, yeah. Now that I think about it, like the last I saw him was uh, Gail Simone's Last Turn of Secret Six, which I was very shaky on at first, but turned out to be very good. I was the same way. I was okay because uh, they had brought Ragman and uh, Scandal Savage as mm-hmm. extra characters into the book. I'm like, okay, Gail. She wants her characters. It's clear that she's got a mandate of some sort that she has yeah. to include all these other whatevers. Uh, but she wants her core. And wound up being one of my favorite Elongated Man stories ever. Yeah. That was a strange take on Elongated it was, Man. but it was really cool. Yeah, it like really kind of a, like a detective noir version. Yeah. I can't remember what his name was, but it was like a mobster style name. Like very, yeah. very noir. But man, we got off, we got off track. But anyways, uh, we knew we were going to a little bit. We do love Suicide Squad. We do like Suicide Squad. Um, always pick it up. Always worth a read. So next up on our list is a uh, a book I chose to skip because last time we've covered it, it didn't really do much for me. Uh, Casey, I'm gonna let you cover uh, Legion Superheroes this week by Brian Michael Bendis, Ryan Souk, and I believe Stephen Byrne from Wonder Twins doing art duties as well. Okay, so this book actually felt a lot like the '80s uh, Legion Superheroes. Uh, let's let's get the, the obvious fact out that I'm still extremely disappointed. I have no idea what the hell Gold Lantern is. He's in three scenes. He never speaks. He just sits back there. It doesn't even look like he even has like a proper mask on. They, they, they just didn't care, which is hilarious because there is actually an alternate cover for Legion 7 of Gold Lantern using Gold Constructs as armor. It looks great. And it, it, it makes me think, oh, hey, I'm going to learn more about this character. No. Not today. <laughs> That's not happening. What I'm going to do is I'm going to get a book full of dialogue about Cosmic Boy talking to the uh, <laughs> the International House of Planets <laughs> 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 about uh, trying to fix the problem with Rimbor. Rimbor is the home planet to uh, Ultra Boy, and apparently Ultra Boy's father is the leader of this kind of tribalistic planet that is trying to secede from IHOP. So that's what's going on. And during that whole thing, the, 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 lar- the Legion at large um, doesn't like the way that Cosmic Boy did it. Cosmic Boy is bitching and complaining because he feels like Brainiac 5 is always stepping on his toes and, and talking like he's a leader. Saturn Girl's like, well, he is the smartest person in the room, and we knew that coming in, so he's going to talk like that because he's smarter than us. That's just the way it is. We find out that Saturn Girl doesn't buy into the whole Xavier School of Thought. She will get into your brain without your consent whenever she pleases and completely validates it. It's like you knew what you were doing when you were talking to me. It's always going to be an open book. So this little cloud of indecision makes Cosmic Boy look bad. Ultra Boy gets voted in. And just as he's being voted into the leadership of the Legion... Um, the Ultra Boy's father, the the leader of the planet of Rimbor, kicks in a door and goes, "Ah, you're all you're you're part of the uh, the IHOP, and therefore I'm at war with you now." And okay, so the Legion is now going to fight uh, Ultra Boy's dad. Whatever. Well, that sounds completely uninteresting. It was. But that said, I'm pretty hyped for the next issue of Legion because it's a jam issue. Where we get like little one or two page stories focusing on different legionnaires, so you might finally get your gold lantern. Finally, so. but uh, yeah, tons of great artists are going to be working on it, including my boy Mike Allred. Very hyped for that. No, let me go on to say that the art on this book is outstanding. Yeah, Ryan, I'm very disappointed that Ryan Ryan Souk finally comes back to do interiors on a regular basis, and it's on Legion. <laughs> I still am. 
optimistic. Uh, I loved Legion as a child. I loved Retro Legion because I used to pick up the uh, the Adventure Comics Digest that would reprint Legion st- stories from the 60s. And I read a lot of 60s Legion. Um, and then, of course, I read 80s Legion being an 80s kid. So I was, uh, I, I was part of the... I saw the, the Dark Side storyline. Mm-hmm. Oh, great. That Darkness was saga. so great during Legion. And I was also akin to all the various Legion reboots. Okay, is this going to be Legion? Okay, no. Is this going to be Legion? No. Is this going to be Legion? No. Oh, by the way, now we're going to make a book called uh, the Le- uh, the Legion of Three Superheroes. Or- Legion of Three Worlds? Yes, Three Worlds, which is basically three groups of Legion. It's like, okay, we're going to merge them all together. Guess what? That's gone. That's what we've got New now. 52 came back in two years. <laughs> yeah. But, uh... I'd read a really fun Matt Fraction interview earlier this week where he talks about how Legion of Superheroes actively punishes anyone who tries to read it. It's completely impenetrable to all of those unfortunate enough to not have been born with a copy of Adventure Comics 247. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that maybe that, that's where I was lucky because I really got a chance to be exposed to the really great eras of Legion when we're introduced to awesome characters like Wildfire. When you find out that uh, light last used to be lightning last but then she got her powers messed with when triplet girl became duo damsel when one of her duplicates got killed off by computo when all these great stories of these deceased uh, legions like invisible kid and feral lad You're talking Kim- nonsense casey it's moon man speak <laughs> <laughs> this is great stuff this was such great stuff and it pains me that it's not part and um, parcel with at any level of continuity. One of these days, one of these days, whenever I get through my gigantic pile of to read stuff, which recently got a huge explosion because I bought a pretty sizable chunk of books recently that <laughs> I have a little, I don't have much buyer's remorse, but I am a little bit like, damn, was that the best use of my money in these times? But whenever I get, whenever I have a nice clean slate of my books out of the way, I really want to try to dive into Legion because I feel like something. Legion. Get 80s Legion. It feels like something you got to commit to, you know? Uh, well, you, well, you do, but you know what? 80s Legion was quality stuff. It really was. I, I, The one that really appeals to me is the Mark Wade post-Zero Hour one from the 90s, because mm-hmm. you also had Dan Abnett and Andy Lanning doing the Legion book alongside that. Gail Simone did a couple of fill-in issues on that. And, like, there's a lot of creators I really like. Mike Waringo does a lot of the art for some of those, so... And, and it's it was I think it's called like three boot is the era yeah but do you know that Legion of Superheroes is actually where Karate Kid came from yeah there's there's a couple of Legionnaires I do like I like Karate Kid I uh, love Matter Eater Lad uh, I like Starboy quite a bit I think I like cool. I like Excess I was all about even the romantic liaisons when we had a uh, uh, Timberwolf and Ultra Boy were all in love with Shadowlass you had Karate Kid who was involved with Princess Projectra who is like royalty in this weird magic world. And so many cool things. Wildfire and Dawnstar. Have you ever seen Jim Shooter's character descriptions for the Legion? Because Jim Shooter, like, his big thing was he started writing Legion Superheroes when, when he was 14 years yeah, old. Yeah, he was a kid. But uh, years years on, uh, he and another another person who worked on it, I can't remember who they were, but the other person did these very detailed, like, psychological profiles of all the Legionnaires. Jim Shooter had their sexual preferences and who they've hooked up with and in very pretty surprisingly graphic detail element lad so gay it was <laughs> yeah I, I was a little shocked by it. i was like oh well well jimmy shoots here <laughs> avengers 200 and again are we yeah well um i don't know if it no that's that's who uh, uh that's that's a low blow i mean he's just talking about like you know people and characters we're not talking about yeah you know Obje- uh, 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 completely giving a green light to some, of, some yeah. of the entries get a little dark. I can understand that, but Avengers 200 is completely yeah, it's, inexcusable. It's a low bar, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's it's the identity crisis Jimmy, for Marvel. Jimmy shoots brings it on himself. He does. You know what? Um, he was not well liked by his colleagues, and you see it sometimes when you see some of the decisions he made. Um, although some of the things he had, to, he had to make the hard decision. He made the hard decision to kill off Jean Grey in, in X-Men 137. 
I don't think that was the hard decision. I think that was the easy decision. You know. Well, I mean, they wanted to keep the character. Yeah. But then Jim Chu was like, "No, you, you killed a planet. You have to answer for that." No one cares about the broccoli people, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> well, it just goes to show you if you if you screw up on that level, you have to pay for it. Man, I can't believe we've gotten into this. Into this. I know wh- we got in this big long discussion <laughs> just talking about <laughs> Legion Seven, Legion of Superheroes, which we Cursed. swore we were only going to spend no, two minutes. We're like, about. we'll do a little bit on Legion, but. Damn it, Legion is just too damn complicated. It is too complicated, and I've got so much more to talk about. Um, I feel like we should do like an episode just on retro Legion, All like right. when it was when it was good. I'll be sure to bring like a big wide brimmed hat so I can just one of those numbers. <laughs> Take a little nap. One of these days, man, I'm gonna bring like I'm gonna I'm gonna find some trade paperbacks that focus on '80s Legion, and we're gonna get educated, you and I. Uh, I do like Keith Giffen and Colleen Duran. There so. you go. I'm gonna make sure I'm gonna get the dark side episodes too. I do want to read the Great Darkness Saga. I've heard nothing but good things about it's that. So good, so good. Now we're gonna talk about the DC Cybernetic Summer Special. Yes, DC does these quarterly books that are always a bunch of fun. A lot of good anthology stories. Usually it comes on like Valentine's Day, the summer, Halloween, and Christmas. So this year it's mostly robot themed. They kind of fudge with that theme a little bit. Yeah, a couple mostly. Times. Like a the the Midnighter and Apollo story there get around it by uh, being like, well, you know, Midnighter's got a computer brain, kind of robot, or or, or the fact that uh, uh, the brain, yeah, the is brain's in that in canister. There. He's he's a he's a brain in a robot. So it kind of counts, I kind guess. Kind of, yeah. But anyways, so I'm just gonna speed through the uh, my four favorite stories from this. All right. So, in order of appearance, there's the uh, Blue Beetle and Booster Gold story by Heath Corson and Scott Koblish, where uh, the blue and gold duo hit up the beach. But it finds it's too crowded, so they plan, oh, we'll just go back in time to last year when it was empty. But wait, we were there, so we'll bump into each other. Nah, man, we'll just go back one day further in the past. And it turns out four other boosters and beetles from down the timeline had the same idea. So we get a six boost blue and gold pileup. So what do you do? They do beach volleyball. <laughs> it's great. And they all team up to fight King Shark and pose for pictures after. It's a very fun little story. That's Loves- how I like my Ted Cord. Exactly. I love seeing blue and gold back together. There's a really fun bit where uh, further down the timeline, the uh, the blue and gold look like the mutants from Dark Knight Returns. They got mohawks and cyclops visors. Oh, God. Very fun. Uh, after that, you've got probably my favorite story, The Bunch, a Midnighter and Apollo story by Steve Orlando and Paul Pettitier. Kind of I read this one. Yes. And... I love Steve Orlando's Midnighter Run. That is, I think, one of the most unsung but excellent books of the last few years. And DC doesn't really do a lot with these two characters these days. They really should, though, because they rule. Yeah. They are a great, loving pair. Uh, Midnighter's got his taste for hyperviolence. Apollo's like a more badass gay Superman. Yeah. I, I think there's a lot of great little innuendos thrown in this issue. My favorite one probably being Midnighter saying, oh, Apollo. You know I always let you go first. <laughs> that 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 got a good hoop and a holler from me at home. And anyways, so uh, they go they go off against also another famously uh, gay duo here in the DC universe, yes. which is Monsignor Mala and the Brain. Love those two. Actually, DC's first gay couple. Yeah, which uh, raised some questions of why the first gay couple is a Brain and a Jar and a Gorilla, but. And 80s. looking at them, you know that this has got Doom Patrol all over it. Yes. It's yeah. so great. So basically, Monster Mala is trying to free his beloved brain, who is in a in a prison cell that's disguised as a cruise ship. And um, Argus, uh, Argus has got him. So yeah. not, it's not really jail. It's, you know... It's, it's the equivalent, I guess, of uh, Project Pegasus, if it was privately owned. Yeah, yeah. Not not great, even less ethical prison. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, they're like Dick doing science to shut out the brain, and the brain is like, ho, 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 Apollo, what did you deny me and Monster Mala's love? Yeah, right. And so, like, they, they wind up getting Mala a cell in there next to him, so. This is about as close as they're going to get. Exactly. And they, they compromise. And Apollo and Midnighter then hit the beach, and uh, the brain calls them the world's finest couple, and that made my heart sing. Love that. Uh, and they, they had a, a famously themed Speedos. Yes, so good. <laughs> I, I, I love Apollo Midnighter. I love that Steve Orlando got to get one last hurrah on those characters before he makes the jump to Marvel. Mm-hmm. So I'm excited to see what he's got next up under his belt. And after that, 
there is a uh, Robot Man story, which I didn't know was going to be in this. Big surprise for you. You get a Robot Man. You go read. Yeah. In a, a cybernetic special, I probably could have guessed there'd be a Robot Man story, mm-hmm. considering he's on the cover. But yeah, by uh, Max Bemis, who's a writer I really enjoy and singer of Save, of uh, Say Anything. Great I band. I don't know anything about that. But uh, Max Bemis working with Greg Smallwood, one of my favorite artists of the last few years. He did uh, Jeff Lemire's Moon Knight run a couple of years back. Oh, okay. And also did Vampironica, a very fun little book. I remember that. Yeah. It was Va- Veronica is a vampire. Exactly what it said on the tin. <laughs> but anyways, here, Robot Man tries to hang out with one of his human friends but finds that the uh, experience just isn't quite there. And so his human buddy's like, well, let's do robot things together. And so they try doing things like going to a hologram Beatles concert, but you have to be able to stream it to your brain. And so it's just a bunch of robots hanging out in an empty stage while Robot Man's going, oh, this is so good. Are you hearing this? He's like, no, I don't have Wi-Fi. He's like, I'll I'll get you the playlist later, dude. (laughs) They go hang gliding with the Metal Men, which is much scarier when you're a a fleshy man and not a brain in a robot suit. The second appearance of the Metal Men in this book. Yes, because they also had a team up with Wonder Woman, which I I was a little cooler on, but it had some nice Nicola Scott art. You find out that Wonder Woman is a fan of uh, Platinum. Uh, Yeah, which I thought was pretty cool. I like seeing Platinum team up with Wonder Woman. But yeah, uh, eventually they they do compromise on something they can both enjoy, reading comic books. Very sweet. We like reading comic books. We do. And uh, most sinister, though, there is a copy of Ultra Comics in the store. And I was like, oh, no. uh, Ultra Comics is the gateway for the gentry and multiversity and how they infect universes. Oh. One of the best single issues of the past decade. Highly recommend checking out all of Multiversity. But if you can get your copy hands on a copy of Ultra Comics, who oh boy, it is a weird, trippy nightmare of a book. Yeah, this is after you've gotten all of the Legion of the Superheroes in the 80s run trade paperback. So you should be buying right now off of Amazon. <laughs> Just Multiversity is only 14 issues. You can read it first. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, a really fun little sweet robot ma- and story. And Doom Patrol is on DC Universe and HBO Max right now. So go watch yeah, it. Yeah, with its second season, an unlikely second season renewal of such an odd show. I'm praying they get a third. Like, they're, they're throwing so many Rachel Pollock concepts in there right now that I'm very happy about. But, like, I want to... S- on season three because i felt like in season one even they were like we got to throw all this gmo stuff on the wall we got to get it all out because i don't know if we're gonna season two well yeah i mean look what dc did the swamp thing yeah which was disappointing i love the swamp thing show but i just hate that it got cut short well i I, internal politics sank that show right yeah it's complicated money it all comes down to money and nothing to do with its quality sunk before it started airing which was frustrating but uh the last story in the book is a very fun, silly romp. A team up between Cyborg and Superman against Cyborg Superman, Hank, Hank Henshaw. And? And a final add to the mist, the Super Cyborg Cyborg Superman. I had to count it on my hand to make sure I said this it right. Is something, this, is a, this is a showdown you really can't say quickly. Yes. He, uh, he claims to come from a universe of triple mashups. So he's a mashup of Cyborg Superman and Cyborg Superman. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, Clark Kent is my dominant, is the dominant mind of the bunch because Cyborg's too sad and Cyborg Superman's too evil. And Cyborg's like, that, that kind of sucks, man. And they're like, what, what did you say your name was? He's like, the Cyborg, the Cyborg Superman, Cyborg Super, or the Super Cyborg Cyborg Superman. And he pulls up his Wikipedia page and Cyborg calls him out by saying, that you pulled up a web page for an alternate universe? Uh, it's an offline version. <laughs> <laughs> it, and it says your abbreviated name is Sucks. <laughs> That's unfortunate. (laughs) So it it turns out it was actually a clever ruse by Batman to keep Cyborg Superman distracted so Superman could clock him good. But then they get a distress call from the actual Super Cyborg Cyborg Superman. (laughs) There's a duplicate? Yes. And this was a fun uh, Stuart Moore who's working on one of the books over at, oh my God, on Ahoy Comics. He's doing Mm -hmm. Captain Ginger, the the space cat comic. And with art by Cully Hamner, who is near and dear to my heart for doing the Jaime Reyes Blue Beetle design. When you say Captain Ginger, the first thing I'm thinking of is a a book that I read as a kid called uh, Captain Furface. It sounds very similar. It does. It's it's an Ahoy Comics book about uh, cats in space. That's what Captain Furface was. Oh, maybe it's a riff on that, I guess. Maybe. But yeah, the the Super Cyborg Cyborg Superman cracked me up. It's such a fun tongue twister. 
And Cully Hamner's art is so kinetic and fun that it's it's an infectious read. So decent book. Yes. Uh, some like like all anthologies, it's a little hit or miss. Yeah. But I think the hit stories are good enough to make it worth the ten dollar price tag. I like the uh, Apollo Moonlighter uh, Moon Knighter thing, and while I didn't really get a chance to really read it, it seemed like the Wonder Woman and the Metal Men thing was a nice. Yeah, it was a nice story. It, it was nice. My my bigger issue. Uh, there, there's a panel where Wonder Woman uh, says it looks like a, just like a monster from an anime I watch, and I was like, I ain't got time to watch anime. No, she ain't got time for that. It, it seemed a little out of character, but it, it was nice seeing her team up with Platinum, and I like seeing the Metal Man get a prominent. Yeah, I like seeing like a single character in a Metal Man getting props. Yeah, there's Platinum on her own, Good without her. having iron gold mercury and tin ah, i know my metal man <laughs> we'll get copper back someday uh, oh yeah that's right maybe maybe copper's in that dan Dio one that's going right now that i'm not reading oh, i forget copper copper's one with a long nose mm, yes yeah but mercury's got the long yes yeah, you made me think mercury at first but no yeah. i think copper also had a long nose yeah but uh anyways that's gonna wrap it up for this week uh, indeed so uh if you like what you if you like what you hear or you like what you're seeing uh subscribe uh, hit that bell. Got a new episode every week. We post every Tuesday or Wednesday, uh, mostly Tuesday. Uh, we got a Patreon where, where our super secret episode five is, has been languishing. Uh, if you want to check that out, and uh, hey, if you want to support us, I mean, we, we definitely could use a little bit of that little uh, cheddar. Keep the keep the camera rolling. Uh, social media links are down below, uh, including my own personal one, uh, Facebook.com/slash My Comic Book Facts, where I introduce. Uh, uh, comic ideas to the common non-comic reader uh, and check us out next week 